Good afternoon. Um, we're moving now to a very interesting session discussing about uh, the renewed role and the potential of the diaspora. We have uh, with us um, uh, an amazing panel. Um, uh, let, let me first uh, welcome and introduce uh, Ms. Natalia Linos, um, Executive Director of FXP Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard. Uh, she is, uh, I think, uh, one of uh, the most uh, vibrant and vivid examples of the potential that we have uh, uh, with, uh, with our academia. Um, um, she has done amazing things and uh, with no doubt she is considered to be one of uh, global experts on public health challenges. Um, Ms. Linos, welcome. Um, and moving to, I think, uh, two very good friends, both of Amsham and myself, um, Mike Manatos and Edi Zemenidis. Uh, we have uh, uh, worked and discussed about these issues for many, many years. We are thrilled having you, uh, GES uh, 2021. Uh, Mike is uh, the president, if I'm not mistaken now, of Manatos and Manatos following a tremendous legacy of uh, the family and renew it. Uh, Eddie is um, the head of um, Hellenic American Leadership Council, um, doing uh, perhaps uh, a, a, a total revamp on what we consider as uh, work in Washington uh, for and behalf of uh, uh, the American Hellenic uh, relations and especially the Greek interests, as we would like to, to call them. Um, uh, Ms. Linos, gentlemen, we are thrilled having you. Uh, and since we are on a very tight schedule, I suggest um, if you'd like initially to have uh, 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 your first idea, your first thought on um, how do you see from the other side of the Atlantic, that new transformative role of Greece, both in economic terms, but as our, as our national brand also. Uh, Ms. Linos. Thank you so much for the invitation. I, you know, I'm an epidemiologist, as you mentioned, and with that in mind, I think what's important to think about is what COVID has taught us in terms of the future, the future of work, the future of cooperation, how we are connected in ways through social media and ways that we can expand. So you know, I'm honored to be part of this panel. I think there is so much opportunity as we have heard from recruiting and retaining the best minds and the brightest. And, and you know, as an academic, I think there are opportunities for collaboration. I'm very excited that Harvard University, my center is working with the University of Athens for a summer program starting this summer on refugee issues, but there's so much more to be said. And I hope our conversation today will really focus on this notion of inclusive and sustainable future. And on the inclusive part, as the woman on the panel, I will harp on, on sort of what it means to have a truly um, inclusive society that brings women and young women in particular into leadership roles, into their full potential, both in academic, business, governance, and other sectors. But I'm so glad to be part of this panel with everyone. Thank you. Mike? Thank you, Alex. Great to be with you today. Um, pleased to be serving with these two uh, friends of mine on the panel. You know, I think in discussing the role of the Greek diaspora in enhancing relations, I think it's important to define what is the Greek diaspora in this context. Because of the two million Greek Americans, they're frankly only a handful who, number one, have the ability to influence U.S. Greek relations, and two, the desire to do so. And so, you know, there, there are a number of organizations out there, and I think it's important for us in this conversation to keep in mind who, the, who those organizations are. Yeah, they're first from the perspective of the church, in addition to the archbishop and the archdiocese, there's Leadership 100, there's the archons of the ecumenical patriarch, there's the archdiocese and council. Each group has hundreds of prominent Greek Americans across the country. Next, you go into the groups that involve the national issues from the Hellenic Initiative, which has you know, donated millions of dollars to Greece in both crisis relief and economic development and entrepreneurship. There's the HEPA and AHI. There's obviously HALC that Endy and, and Nikos Mouyaris had uh, the, 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 the foresight to see the, the 
the gaps in engaging young professionals in online advocacy and is doing great work there. There's the National Hellenic Society and sending over 500 Greek American students to Greece. There's the extremely impactful Cypriot American organizations, uh, Philip Christopher, Kiriakou Papasteriannou, Tsivikos, Zamos, Komodromos, Kekoyanis, others who've spent decades promoting the national issues. And then there's the regional groups, but you also got an addition to all of that, our Greek Americans who serve in government, the, Greek, the six Greek American members of Congress. Um, the, the Philhellenes like Menendez and Deutsch and Maloney have also been very impactful. So I think an important part of this whole conversation is not only what the potential is, but finding ways to continue to engage those influential Hellenes in doing so. Okay, Eddie. You know, you talk about brand changing and this may be a little counterintuitive since you've you've identified me as the, the head of an organization, but I want to argue for a more expansive uh, definition uh, than and Mike is right about. These are the groups that are traditionally uh, leading the charge. But w w in this world, um, and I'm really glad that Dr. Linos is with us today because I actually think we've dropped the ball uh, as Hellenism in engaging. We have people like Dr. Linos is at Harvard. How often do we have our great academics? We we keep we we keep trumpeting how educated we are and how well represented we are in academia, and we're taking people who are really on the cutting edge. Uh, of all kinds of uh, research and, and leading here in this country, and we're not using them uh, and utilizing them in the bilateral relationship. So I, I'd love to hear more from Dr. Linos on that. But some of, the, uh, some of the, the paradigm shifting that we have to engage in, that's one using uh, these academics, who I think are much, uh, probably the most underutilized research in diaspora relations. But we also have to expand geographically. You know, Greece sits there and thinks of what, thinks of the US uh, and thinks of Washington and New York, maybe sometimes Boston. Uh, you identify, in fact, you identified how because what we do in, in Washington and 90% of our work is outside of Washington. Uh, Alex, you came to, to Chicago and you know, and you know, uh, their minister, Yoriadis, just right before COVID, foreign minister, uh, deputy foreign minister, Fragoyanis came to Chicago and you are dealt with corporations that are now investing in Greece. Right. We have to we have to realize America is not simply a country. It's it's what you would see as a continent. Greece is the size of my home state. Its economy is smaller than my home states. Uh, so we need to, to get to paradigm shifting and not look at the diaspora in this narrow. Hey, we're dealing with the foreign policy issues or Congress or the United States. We must utilize the diaspora for its reach in the economic and political superpower in the world. And that's the kind of paradigm shift that I hope we can talk about today. I, I, I think, uh, I, you, you know, I agree on, on, on this issue. Um, um, to, to me, it was always been a, a tremendous surprise, even from our end here in, in Greece, that we have never really um, capitalized on the immense uh, opportunities that the Greek academia uh, opens up for us in, in all these amazing universities and colleges across the United States. Um, one of the things that to me is very, uh, um, uh, I'm very interesting in finding out is um, in Greece we know all these things that uh, have changed during the past three, four years, especially right after uh, Thessaloniki 2018. We've seen a tremendous change in the bilateral relations, but also it, it, it has been a tremendous change on our economic model, on our uh, public governance uh, across the board. Um, whether it's uh, the, the, the Greek or Greek-American professors in all these universities, whether it's uh, all these prominent Greek-American organizations or the Philippines, as Mike uh, said, or whether there is this whole universe of prospects across the United States. Do you think that we have managed to find a way to communicate all those changes in an effective and efficient way? Do they really know? Do you really know how many things have changed here in Greece? 
Eddie? Well, listen, there, so I'll, I'll, okay, I'm happy to start. I think, does everybody really know? Listen, we, tr we track it for a living, so uh, it's unfair to put it on us. But no, people don't know. I actually think Greece is in this great launching point right now because what happened, and we hear this, we hear this term often in America. <clears throat> there was there was the bigotry of low expectations when it came to Greece, uh, politically, economically, socially. Uh, let's go back to the beginning of the crisis, and you can look at this up. This isn't speculation. You could look at the front pages of the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, the Washington Post. Uh, what were they talking about? They were talking about Golden Dawn. Right? They were talking about oh my God, fascism came back in Greece. Right. Greece is the only country that actually didn't no party even discuss putting Golden Dawn in in government. And it was the one that most uh, effectively uh, battled as a country, this this racist, demagogic uh, populist movement. Um, but that was a surprise for a lot of people. Uh, it was a surprise for a lot of people when when Greece faced its worst in the economic uh, crisis. Every page, every editorial page in, in the US was, was talking about Greece crashing out of the Euro, Greece not being able to come back. It was a surprise politically. Uh, and Mike can tell you because I remember it was at the at a conference that he organized. We had Obama administration officials coming to 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 lecture the new Greek government about don't veto the Minsk sanctions and don't get into Turk stream and don't get close to the Russians. And it wasn't Gre Greece never went in that direction. In fact, Turkey, who they still kind of cozy up to too much is the one that went in that direction. So Greece exceeded every expectation. Now it still exceeds expectations. Uh, and, and Dr. Linos can talk about how it exceeded uh, the expectations on the COVID front, because when everything was breaking out in Italy, again, American media was like, it's going to go to Greece. But no, they don't really know. The brand is better, but we hurdled, we, we kind of jumped a very low hurdle. Now I think the real work starts now. How how did we get past that, that bigotry of low expectations? We have higher expectations. How do we raise the bar and meet those higher expectations? Um, my, Mike, your view, uh, especially with regard to the fact that you have this uh, um, amazing experience of working for so many years with past Greek governments in, in, approaching, uh, in approaching Washington and other cities in the U.S.? Thank you, Alex. I think that uh, not enough Greek Americans, especially influential Greek Americans, are aware of, of the remarkable changes in Greece. Um, but I think even more challenging is articulating that information to policymakers, which would actually result in changes of U.S.-Greece relations. And that really is the highest hurdle for us, uh, because I think it's one thing to get our community to better understand it, but it's another thing to get them to be able to find a way to articulate to these key policymakers who influence uh, those those relationships from a government to government level, and that frankly takes resources. You know, you, you look at you look at other uh, organizations, other governments that do it well here in Washington. They pour in, you know, millions if not tens of million dollars a month into that kind of an operation. Um, I think uh, this government, this prime minister, this embassy gets it, and I think is working in that direction. Uh, but you know, if, from our our perspective as well, those of us who not only work with Washington but with the national community, um, we need to find a way to reach these new developing stars like, like Dr. Linos and engage them and, and, and equip them to be able to communicate with policymakers and other uh, thought cultivators in, in the United States who can help get this message out about Greece. So there's, there's a lot of work to do, but the good news is there's organizations out there like Andy's and ours that spend every waking moment trying to figure out ways to do this better. Ms. Linos, uh, uh, you realize that we're treating you now as the all-star um, ambassador of New Greece. And I, I hear it. That, that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> and do you think that people like you um, um, have, the, um, have the necessary input in order to somehow portray all these changes that uh, uh, occur in Greece? 
besides, of course, as they are reflected by your work or by your colleagues? No, thank you so much for the question. And I think it's important to highlight what my colleagues have said that, you know, the Greek diaspora is not monolithic. We have the well-established Greek American families that are third, fourth generation who really have a tie to culture, to a village, to, you know, to the tourism. You know, that's their main engagement is when they come in the summers to see Yiyan and Papu. But there are currently, you know, younger generations of people like myself immigrants first generation who have stronger ties and possibilities to be involved in both um, the expansion of business opportunities, academic partnerships. And I think that layer we haven't yet invested in significantly. For example, I know so many academics at Harvard of Greek heritage who spend every summer in Greece. And wouldn't it be a unique opportunity to build some mentorship relationships? That people to people place. I mean, I know Mike, talked about policy, and I would love for us to have that conversation about how do we influence policymaking, but there is the direct opportunity also for people to people, mentorship relationships, and kind of, you know, reversing what has been labeled the brain drain um, that has happened over the generations. I think, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be an ambassador of kind of that Greek American future as, as a young woman. I I'm excited that, you know, there has, I have received a lot of support, especially from Andy and others. Uh, but I don't think the image of Greece is going to change one person at a time. We need to work collectively. And I do think that some of the issues that are being addressed in this symposium around climate change, around air quality, around uh, rights of people with disabilities, people of all gender, religion, ethnic minorities, the Roma, you know, we have a program at my center on the rights of the Roma people in Europe, you know, there is so much that can be said to be at the forefront of what inclusive and sustainable future looks like. And I trust that Greece can be there. And then I will continue to be proud to be an ambassador for the Greek American community. Um, th thank you. Thank you so much for that, for that answer. Uh, M Mike, for so many years, um, our relationship with regard to the diaspora has always been uh, based mostly on Greek-Turkish relations, U.S.-Turkish relations, U.S.-Greek relations, mostly on the geopolitics, mostly on the Aegean, on Cyprus. Um, however, as Ms. Lino says, there is a whole new world uh, in front of us uh, changing, whether it is uh, climate change, whether it is the health issues, whether it is a business relationship, the, high, the, 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 the new technologies, where in, in all those industries, in all those sectors, there are success stories for uh, Greece, success stories for U.S.-Greece collaborations, um, and in most of them we, with Greek Americans somewhere there. Um, do you think that uh, we have now the necessary capacity and the necessary tools to start working on those areas as well, aside of all the interesting and lasting issues that we will have with regard to geopolitics? I certainly hope so, hope so, because that that truly is the future of U.S.-Greece relations. And you really hit an important point uh, that's a, a a major struggle for us in Washington is that for for decades U.S. policymakers have been conditioned to whenever they hear Turkey they think of Greece, whenever they hear Greece they think of Turkey, and one has to follow the other. If there's a phone call made to the foreign minister of Greece, there has to be a phone call made to the foreign minister of Turkey. But I think that. As you say, times have changed and, and this government is saying, no, you don't need to make those calls and you need to start looking at Greece, uh, for example, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean Alliance of Greece, Cyprus and Israel, the three democratic countries in the region, how that can impact uh, the United States security interests in the region, how the United States can get more involved in that. And that has nothing to do with Turkey. And so we need to be thinking more along those lines. And there's really remarkable things that Greece is doing uh, to, to help the United States and things the United States can help Greece um, and, and all kinds of sectors that you mentioned. So you're right, that's a big part of our focus these days. Hey, Eddie, we have discussed- so I, I, took, I took your question a little differently. Uh, I think Greece is ready for that. I just don't think it has, it, it, the infrastructure is not right there. I think the infrastructure is actually wrong. Uh, this having one, you know, one official dealing with the, the, the diaspora and the deputy foreign minister, that doesn't, that 
actually doesn't get it, right? I actually think every ministry, uh, the Ministry of Education should have someone who is uh, dedicated uh, to dealing with uh, the academic community. Uh, the uh, Minister Yorgadis, who's doing a great job, by the way, this is every minister is trying to do this themselves. It's just not an institutional setup, but there should be definitely somebody in that ministry that's dealing with, with, with diaspora Greeks in industry. Uh, the setup right now uh, almost by default goes to just traditional groups, goes to, for example, the church. And there's a lot that the church brings to the table. It doesn't bring economic help or business to business ties uh, to Greece. The institutional framework has to be substantially revamped. Uh, the good thing is, I think uh, Greece has a an all star team of diplomats maybe for the first time in the United States. Let's look at how can we maximize their effectiveness? Who are we sending over as commercial uh, attaches? Uh, I think there has to be a, a tremendous, tremendous reevaluation because if we don't do that reevaluation, we're going to get stuck into the Washington, New York model at a time when the economic power of the United States is going outside of the Excella corridor. And we're going to miss opportunities. Okay, so how do we elevate our agenda on those areas outside Washington and New York? How can we empower a new, a new discussion about um, sure. our interests or our potential in uh, Houston or in uh, Salt Lake City or I don't know where? So, you give the, so for example, you give the Ministry of Energy someone who is dealing with diaspora affairs in the Ministry of en Energy, not so they have to go running to the deputy foreign minister who has to deal with traditional uh, diaspora groups. There's just not time. But if you have someone in the Ministry of Energy whose only job is to deal with with diaspora in that field, you're going to find the Chevron and Exxon engineers who are dealing with that, or you're going to find, like you did when you came to Chicago, the two Greek Americans that are at a renewable company like Invenergy. When, when you have someone in the Ministry of Education or or culture dealing specifically with overseas Hellenes like Dr. Linos, you're going to find the cutting edge research that's being done by Hellenes that nobody in Greece knows about. And, and you also have to reshape how at your embassies and consulates, you're training these commercial officers. They show up and they go to the people who are selling olive oil, or they go to someone who knows, you know, it happens, a Greek is heading this company. Right. They're they're really getting the lowest of low hanging fruit, but they're not they're not really connecting the dots. There are there are attorneys who represent some of the biggest overseas investors. There are people there are Greek Americans at high levels at every Fortune 500 company. So they we have to have the right people here. We have to have uh, and and we have to have the right people in Greece who are connecting those dots. Miss, thank you, Eddie. Miss Linos, do, do you see the same, let's say, gap or the tiny uh, inefficiency with regard to uh, academic sort of diplomacy or science diplomacy, however you want to call it? I do think that there is a gap, and I do think that individuals, including the Greek consul in Boston, have done tremendous steps to bring the academic community together, the Greek Americans, the networks, um, and you know he's a role model, I think, for others to to pass on. And I think you know the minister, Minister Karameos, has been working with um, academic institutions across um, the U.S. to build partnerships, not only with the Greek diaspora, but also with non-Greeks. And here I do want to put a plug for that. You know, what COVID has taught us is that workers are in now in a place where they can demand different things. Remote work is becoming the norm. People want a better balance of, you know, life and work. And countries, other countries are recruiting folks from all over the world. Greece has that potential. You have a great climate, uh, great people, good food. You know, there is a possibility to also envision uh, post-COVID world where um, there are even third or fourth generation or even non-diaspora people who want to move to Greece to be part of a future. And making that simple is really helpful. I mean, I, I through the people to people piece, you know, I have friends who have said, you know, is there work 
in Greece? Could I move to Greece? And I think on that front, we have the potential for the diaspora to also connect Greece to the intellectual minds, academics, not only of other Greek Americans, but other experts in the field is huge. I have not heard ever of someone not willing to go to Greece for a summer conference or something like that. So let's not lose those opportunities in the post COVID world where work is being redefined to bring the brightest of the globe to Greece. Thank you so much. Um, I think we are gradually going to my last question uh, or they're gonna start shooting things on me here. Um, you have heard, I'm sure all of you, um, I know that we have heard it more than more than the times that we could. Um, Ambassador Payet saying that um, the recent uh, agreements, the recent milestones that we achieve in the Greek-American relations are not practically um, uh, a circle that is fulfilled, but it's, it's, it's a new circle that now opens. There, there are so much more things that we are, there are there to achieve um, with regard to the Greek-American relations. Um, from your take, what do you think is what comes next with regard to, to our bilateral relations? Eddie? Well, one, again, it's a, it's a paradigm shift, right? I, I think there's, there's a lot more that can be done region to region, city to city. You know, you have as one of the great, going back to our branding, I told you about all the bad news stories. There are good news stories, too. The New York Times covered, for example, what Mayor Bakoyanis is doing in Athens on climate. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Kunalakis has, has played a key role in helping uh, you know, California train Greece on how to, to fight fires. Uh, we, we have to break out of this narrow vision of Greece that it only, you, you know, you only think about Greece when you think about Turkey or even the, the East Med. There are, you know, here in, in Chicago, there was this amazement about how Greece handled circulate people circulating during the early days of COVID via technology. Uh, so, that's that's one two the we have to go from pillar of of stability which is one of uh ambassador Pyatt's favorite words we i think over his tenure we've put a lot of meat on those bones to pillar of dynamism uh it's greece hurdled that low bar of stability we are stable we're stable greece is stable both parties are stable. There's not this, oh my gosh, if one party's in, Greece is up for grabs. If not, no, Greece is a politically stable, a Western-oriented country uh, that offers a lot. But there's some dynamism in there that's not getting, uh, not getting enough play, whether it's how we handled COVID to how we're reshaping the economy in Greece. Uh, Pfizer is coming in. Now Amazon's coming in. And the, the even the augmented the augmented reality experience in Olympia should be uh, should be really uh, promoted more, and the number of direct flights should be uh, promoted more as well. It, it has those by themselves have a way to to make a lot of what Dr. Linos just talked about uh, a reality of people working working in Greece. So I think we're just scratching the surface. And frankly, I think people who, who think, uh, who are saying, oh, there's something bigger out there, their imagination has not yet fully run wild. And we have to let our imagination run wild. Mike, your take? So I think I wear two major hats in this discussion. One is of a family that for 85 years has been promoting Hellenism and Orthodoxy with US policymakers. And from that perspective, um, it's a new Greece. It's a new message. It's a new focus. And I think that we're just beginning on communicating that properly. The prime minister, as you probably read, is scheduled to visit the United States early next year. And I think you're going to see the beginning of Washington welcoming and better understanding that new Greece and that new paradigm, as Andy said. My other major hat is of all the top national organizations I serve on the board of or have been worked with for decades, and there needs to be more of an emphasis, and there's starting to be so, on reaching and, and supplementing our network of Greek Americans who can help us in this cause. Uh, the, the Dr. Linos is out there that, that, are, that are, are emerging, but uh, you know, with some of the ideas that Andy mentioned and Dr. Linos, all of these organizations are, are trying to find ways to uh, further engage 
proud Hellenes, either first, second, third, or fourth generation or recent immigrants to help us uh, further solidify U.S.-Greece relations. So it's a very exciting time, very much so. Dr. Lons, do you share the same view? Is it do, a very I'm, exciting time? It is an exciting time, and I think as long as the Greek-American community and also the Greek, Ameri the Greek community embraces new faces, young people, I do think there's so much dynamism in the tech world that is, you know, under 30, Uh, young people, women, uh, people with mixed, you know, ethnic or religious backgrounds. I think it'll be a tremendously uh, opportune time for us to to move forward and really, really bring in the full diaspora and it's all its complexity and diversity. I want to thank you all so much. Uh, I hope we had so much more time to discuss on this thing. I mean, your experience and your thoughts and your insight are super valuable for all of us here. Um, I hope we can do it again in the near future. Dr. Ilnos, Mike, Eddie, thank you so much from Athens. I hope next year we can be all together in Athens. For the meantime, thank you from the Amcham. Thank you. Thank you.